Great. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, it is eight o'clock on the East Coast, five o'clock on the West Coast. We will try to finish exactly at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, because we respect your time. And we know that everybody's on Zoom too much these days. And so what tonight is about is thanking you. This is a thank you webinar. We know of no better way <laughs> to thank you than to give you the receipts, than to, to show you the results that all of your time as volunteers and all of your investment as donors into our work actually has been getting results. And so we, this is going to be the first of many times that we thank you, because as we get more and more of our results in, we want to give them to you, but this is the first big batch. So let's jump into things. I'm going to slot, uh, share my screen here. And this is a very quick outline of how the next 56 minutes is going to go. This is not an introductory webinar, uh, but I am going to spend just two or three minutes giving a brief reminder of what EVB EVP does, how, and why. Then we're going to get into when we expect to get more results in and the type of research that we're going to be doing over the next few months. Then we're going to dive deep into the data. What voters we contacted this year the results that we got back over the first nine months of the year, because that's pretty much the results that we have from updated voter files, some really exciting things we learned from messaging experiments. And then, yes, there are always more elections. And so we're going to let you know what's on the horizon. And then finally, as Shannon said, we will have a Q&A session, but please don't let that stop you from asking questions while I'm presenting in the Q&A button at the bottom. All right. So a very quick reminder of what we do at the Environmental Voter Project. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit that turns non-voting environmentalists into consistent voters. That's what we do. We find environmentalists who don't vote, and then we turn them into better voters. A good way to think of us is we aren't interested in changing people's opinions or changing people's minds. There are lots of great groups that do crucially important work convincing folks to care more about climate change, but we don't do that. What we do at the Environmental Voter Project is we find people who are already convinced, people who care so deeply about climate and other environmental issues that it's their number one priority over all others, yet they aren't voting. And so what these people need is not to have their minds changed, but to have their behavior changed. And so that is what we focus on at the Environmental Voter Project, finding the millions and sometimes tens of millions of already persuaded died in the wool super environmentalists who aren't voting and turn them into better voters. We do it in a three-step process. First, identification. We work with data scientists to build huge predictive models on voter files that help us individually identify people who have a really high likelihood of listing climate as their number one priority over all other issues. Yet we can tell from public voter files that they're not voting. Because although who you vote for is always secret, whether you vote or not, that's public record. So once we can identify these super environmentalists, we can then cross-reference that with their public voting histories and isolate these people who need our behavioral interventions. That's when we go to step two, mobilization. Working with many of you and thousands of volunteers around the country, we canvas and we send postcards and we call these voters with behavioral science-informed messaging optimized to turn them into better, more consistent voters. And then we on EVP staff supplement those volunteer efforts with direct mail and digital ads to also boost the voting behavior of these low propensity environmental voters. Finally, step three, habit reinforcement. You don't need to be a behavioral scientist to understand 
that it's really hard to get people to change their habits if you only talk to them once every two years when there's a big federal election going on. That doesn't work very well. And so we take very seriously this year-round, every election approach, where even if there is a teeny tiny local election that has nothing to do with environmental policy making, we at the Environmental Voter Project are still going to get involved in that election because it's important for changing people's behavior. We honestly view every election as a precious behavioral intervention opportunity as we go on this path of taking these people who don't vote and turning them into consistent voters who show up in every election. Because when we're able to do that, when we're able to turn these millions of non-voting environmentalists into people who show up all the time, that's when politicians change how they lead on climate and clean air and clean water and environmental justice. Not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because politicians really love winning. And if we can help flood the electorate with people who care deeply about climate and environmental issues, politicians will follow because nothing motivates a politician more than the prospect of winning or losing an election. So this is what we do with the Environmental Voter Project. We are working in these 17 states. And as I said, we are doing it year round. And if you would like more information about our work at the Environmental Voter Project, again, this is not an introductory webinar. So I would encourage you, who, those of you who don't know that much about us, please go to environmentalvoter.org slash about. You can also go to a previous video that we made of an introduction webinar to the Environmental Voter Project that's on our YouTube page. And uh, I believe we'll be supplying those links in the chat for you. All right, that's it for the introduction. Let's dive in to uh, the meat of it. When we look ahead to the remainder of this month and then the following three months, this is what we're going to be focused on at the Environmental Voter Project. Right now, we are going through strategic planning to figure out, are there ways to uh, better align our work with our organizational focus and our organizational goals? We are researching whether we should expand into additional states beyond those 17 that I just showed to you. And that's a lot of really in-depth voter file research and polling research and political research in all 50 states. So we take this all very, very seriously. Right after the new year, we're going to begin building new predictive models. We want to take a fresh look in all 17 of our states and perhaps maybe some new expansion states so that we can better identify who these super environmentalists are. Just because someone was someone we identified as a super environmentalist a year and a half ago doesn't mean they still are. Moreover, there are a whole bunch of new voters, people who have aged into being eligible to vote, 18 and 19-year-olds, who we weren't able to target because we, they aged into voting after we had built our models. And so we always want to refresh these models every year, year and a half, so that we can be as precise as possible with our targeting. Many of our volunteers reach out to us and say how pleased they are with our targeting and all the people they talk to when they knock on the doors or make phone calls, or most of them are, are these super environmentalists who really do need help voting. Well, the only way that we're able to do that is by taking this research really seriously and doing it as often as possible. Significant voter mobilization is then going to begin in February. We are doing a little bit still in December and a little bit next month in January. I'm going to tell you about that in a second. But it really, really picks up again in February, and I'm going to show you some of those elections that I'm referring to. We also hope to finalize our new predictive models by then. And then in March, we hope that all of our results from this year, from 2022, will be available. Actually, I shouldn't say all. New York State takes forever. We will, we will not have New York State data until like June or July, but we hope to have data from 
almost all of our states ready by March of 2022 so that we can release to you all of the stuff that we're not going to talk about tonight. That is also when we hope to have finished our new round of predictive models, including in any states that we might expand into beyond our current 17. All right. So what do we do in 2022? And as you'll see, we're not quite done yet. There's still one more election that I'm going to tell you about in a second. But in 2022, we were targeting 5.5 million low propensity environmental voters in these 17 states. And by low propensity, I mean, we looked at their previous voting history and they had never voted in a midterm or they hadn't voted in a midterm for so long that we had to think they're unlikely to do it this time without getting one of these behavioral science informed nudges from us or many of those nudges. Now we didn't reach all 5.5 million of them. Some due to budget reasons, others because you know it didn't make sense to reach into every teeny little you know hamlet and village in Massachusetts this year or in New York City this year or things like that. Uh, and also just because sometimes we can't knock on every door. It's a lot of doors to knock on. Uh, we're very good at making calls, and we're very good if we have the, the finances of doing the digital ads and direct mail, but some people can only be reached by door-to-door -door canvassing, and obviously we can't reach everybody everywhere all the time. But we're very, very proud to have spoken to 2.4 million unique individual low propensity environmental voters in calendar year 2022. Almost 300,000 of those communications came from many of you knocking on doors, writing postcards, or calling up voters. And for those of you who are on phone banks, we had over 160,000 full conversations with these low propensity environmental voters. That is enormous, and as I'll show you in a few minutes, we have the receipts to prove that these calls do increase turnout. And so these aren't just big numbers, they actually moved the dial on election night. We at the Environmental Voter Project staff also sent out over 2.1 million pieces of direct mail. We also had some paid phone banks, and we had huge digital ad campaigns. And again, all of this messaging, whether it was coming from EVP staff or coming from EVP volunteers, was informed by behavioral science experiments that showed us that if we do deliver these messages, they have at least increased turnout in the past. And so we have a really good uh, reason to believe that they will increase turnout in the future as well. This was a big, big year, and let this be the second of many times this evening that I say thank you. Thank you for being part of one of the biggest, most sophisticated voter turnout operations in the country this year. I'm not just the executive director, I, I founded this organization, and I can't tell you how amazed I am that you have taken this idea, all of you, and made it into something this big and this sophisticated and this successful. There's very, very little to do with me and everything to do with all of you. And I hope you take enormous pride in these numbers because you did this, you did this. All right, how do we test the impact of these interventions? Well, I'm going to just go back in a second, go back here. Many of these elections that you see up there at the top, the local and congressionals, the state primaries, the generals, the runoffs, many, if not all of them, were instances where we increased turnout. But we can't always prove that, right? And as I think many of you at the Environmental Voter Project know, just because we can see on voter files that the people we contacted ended up voting doesn't mean we can claim sole responsibility for getting them to vote. That's a little lazy. It's not terribly scientifically precise. And so we really try to measure this with precision, not just because we want to be able to prove when we have an impact, but because we also want to get better. 
And if things that we're doing aren't working, we want to stop doing that stuff <laughs> and double down on the stuff that is working. And so we run what's called randomized control trials. And very, very quickly, what those are, at least in this context, is let's say we identify a million of these low propensity environmental voters in a state like Pennsylvania. What we do not do is immediately start calling and canvassing and mailing and sending digital ads to all 1 million of these people we've identified. No, before we talk to a single one of them, what we do is we randomly separate them into two groups. One is called a treatment or intervention group, and the other is a control group. That control group, usually that has about 15%, or so 150,000 in this example, we never talk to them. We set them aside and we never talk to them. The remaining 850,000, those are the people you call and you canvas and you send postcards to and we mail and we send digital ads to. Then the election happens. And remember what I alluded to earlier, whether you vote or not is public record. And so a few months after the election happens, we can see how many of the low propensity environmental voters voted in our control group that we did not talk to, and then compare that to how many of them voted in our treatment group of the people we did deliver our behavioral science informed messaging to. And as long as that second step where we separated those two groups at the beginning, as long as that was truly random and the numbers are big enough, what this approach allows us to do is isolate where we, the Environmental Voter Project, are solely responsible for increasing turnout while controlling for all other variables. I mean, even if there was a Senate campaign spending a billion dollars to mobilize voters, it, it, even if they were using environmental messaging, well, we've controlled for that, right? They should have been contacting just as many people in our control group as in our treatment group, unless they hacked into our system and decided, eh, let's only talk to the people who the Environmental Voter Project threw in their treatment group. Like, like we've controlled for all that. And so what these randomized control trials allow us to do is isolate what our collective impact was as volunteers and staff in these mobilizations. And this is what we have seen in the first nine months of the year. I'm only gonna be able to show you the randomized control trial results from the first nine months because we're still waiting for voter files to be updated in almost all of our states from any elections that happened in October and November and earlier this month. But in the first nine months, we can tell you that in these elections, we, so all of you and all of us, were solely responsible for boosting turnout over one percentage point over our control group in huge statewide elections, the Texas primary, the Colorado primary, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, New Hampshire, Arizona, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania and New Mexico were a little bit below 1%. In New Hampshire and Arizona, we almost hit 2%. And then in, the, in that Alaska special congressional election, remember that, that Mary Peltola ended up winning? We boosted turnout over three and a half percentage points over our control group. Now to be clear, we obviously didn't target every single person in the state. We were only targeting low propensity environmental voters. But these are big numbers. All of you just lived through the midterms where most of the margins were smaller than this in many states. And we didn't throw the kitchen sink at these primaries. Usually we were just using a single mail piece plus calls or things like that. These are extraordinary results. And they're extraordinary not just because 1.3% or 1.9 or 3.6 are big, big numbers in the politics business, but also because remember, we work year round. We don't parachute into one of these races and then leave and never come back. No, we picked right up working with these voters going into the midterm general elections and we improved upon this and we helped them grow their good voting habits. 
This is why we work year round. We know that there is value. There is, there is hidden gold in these low turnout, sleepy elections. And many times the best way to make sure that a first time voter shows up in November is to talk to them in January through September in elections like this. This is where new midterm voters were born this year. They were born in the winter and spring and summer elections. And boy, were all of us, and I really mean it because you did a lot of this work, boy, were all of us enormously successful in getting a lot of great results. Not only did we get a lot of great results, though, but we learned a lot about messaging. And we think this is important to explain in some detail for a few reasons. One, we want you to know that we take this stuff seriously and we only ask our volunteers to do and we only ask our donors to support stuff that we know is working and messages that we know work. But also because we work with a lot of partners and we also know that you as funders and as volunteers work with a lot of other organizations and we want to share our knowledge. And we do that. We train other organizations. We speak in academic environments. But another way to share knowledge is in webinars like this. And we want to show you some interesting messages that we're really getting a lot of good results for us. So the first one I just want to show you is we wanted to run a phone calls experiment. Uh, even in the largest of volunteer phone banks, it's hard to have enough conversations with enough voters in a single election to get big enough data sets that we can be certain with what's called statistical significance that we are increasing turnout over our control group. So for the March 1st Texas primary this year, we used a paid phone bank and had them use pretty much the same script that our volunteers use. And we were thrilled to see that that experiment with phone calls alone increased turnout 1.1 percentage points among the over 80,000 low propensity environmental voters we reached when compared to our control group. And that was a statistically significant result at a 95% confidence interval. For those of you who, who know what that means, we only report out results that have a 95% confidence interval, which means we know that pretty much the result was not due to random occurrence. Uh, we know that we were solely responsible for it. What we really, really like about this result is as many of you know, when you volunteer with the Environmental Voter Project and you're doing these phone banks, you might be working in a low turnout election like the, uh, like the Austin, Texas mayoral runoff we were just mobilizing voters for a few days ago. They had their election on Tuesday. Well, there's no way we're going to contact enough people in an election like that to yield a statistically significant result in a randomized control trial. So in a teeny election like that, that we'll never be able to report back to you and say, we can prove that you increased turnout. But because we were able to do this experiment back in March, we can at least say, we know that at least in this context and likely in other contexts too, these phone calls can increase turnout. We can be absolutely certain of that. And so even in these small elections, we know that you are making a difference. And this gives us such a great degree of confidence to be doing all of this phone banking work. All right, next experiment. We started getting a lot of great results at the end of 2021 in local elections with something called loss aversion mail. I'm gonna describe uh, what the psychological concept of loss aversion is in a second, because I'm going to show you some examples of this mail piece. But first, I just want to describe the experiment. Uh, it was one six inch by 11 inch mail piece. It's pretty much the size of, I mean, it's a little different, but pretty much the size of probably the laptop screen that you're looking at. 
We sent it to almost 270,000 low propensity environmental voters in the statewide primary in Pennsylvania. And in particular, we were going after 30 year olds or older because they're more likely to read their mail. And we were going, we were targeting people who we knew were unlikely to vote, not just in that primary, but also in the general this year. Yet they had voted in a presidential election. So these are what what is commonly referred to as drop-off voters, people who vote in presidentials, but nothing else. And that was something that we wanted to take advantage of. Before I show you what this technique is and what the very, very simple, I mean, almost like absurdly simple design that we used was, this ended up boosting turnout 0 0.8 percentage points. Just this one mail piece. That was the entire campaign. One mail piece. Boosted almost 1% over our control group, which is a big number. All right, this was the front of the mail piece. You can see a watermark mark there. That's the union print shop that we use, but that was not on any of the mail that went to our, it went to our voters. It simply said, thank you for voting in 2020. Don't ruin your good voting record in 2022. And this concept of loss aversion here that I described is this. About 20, 30 years ago, some behavioral psychologists and behavioral economists started to realize that people just hate losing things. They hate losing things so much that most people are more worried about the idea of losing $5 than they are excited by the idea of getting $5. Like we hate losing more than we like getting things of the same value. And so we are loss averse. We are disproportionately loss averse. And so we wanted to take advantage of that with this voter turnout mail by saying, you know what? Let's not approach these people who never vote in midterms and ask them to do a new thing. Let's not say, hey, do this thing that you've never done before. Instead, let's endow them with something of value and make it seem like they're about to lose it. And so what we did was we said, hey, thank you for voting in 2020. You now have this new voting record that you're building. You did it. Way to go. Awesome. You're a good voter. Now don't screw it up. Don't lose it. Don't ruin your good voting record in 2022. And on the backside, we reinforced that. We said, we want to help you be a good voter. Whether you vote is public record, thank you for voting in 2020. Keep your good voting record in 2022 by voting in this election. That was it. It's a very, very simple mail piece. And just getting this one piece in, in what was actually a fairly high turnout statewide primary boosted turnout 0 0.8 percentage points over our control group. Now, we wouldn't expect to get the same robust result in like a presidential general election from just one mail piece. But this is very instructive. This should be instructive to the larger climate movement and the larger progressive movement that this concept of loss aversion messaging with drop-off voters, people who vote in presidentials but nothing else, is extraordinarily powerful. This is certainly something we are going to be using more often, and we hope that we can see other people use it more often. Another important thing that we learned from this, well, as I said, first of all, it boosted turnout 0.8 percentage points over our control group, but we saw some potentially really interesting differences among different racial groups. Now, I want to be clear here, because the population of target voters was disproportionately white, that was the only population that we could see statistically significant results from. But among Hispanic voters and among AAPI voters, although the data wasn't statistically significant, likely because just our target populations were too small for those people, although it wasn't statistically significant, boy, look at how big those numbers are. And so we're not really confident that we should just run to the bank and say, oh my gosh, loss aversion mail clearly works amazingly well with Hispanic voters. But when we see numbers like this, 
boy, does it make us want to experiment more with this. This is what we would call a suggestive result. We aren't confident that this message is particularly impactful with AAPI and Hispanic voters, but boy, do these numbers make us want to experiment more. And just very quickly before I move on, the reason we use these somewhat uh, antiquated like nomenclature uh, is because African American and Caucasian and Asian and Hispanic are the terms that are used in voter files. We don't want to use different terms because oftentimes, you know, Black and African American aren't perfectly analogous or Hispanic and Latinx aren't perfectly analogous. And so we just choose to go with a nomenclature that's in voter files. Just wanted to explain that. Another thing that we saw was an enormous differential between people identified as male in voter files and people identified as female in voter files. This is another way that you might be able to optimize your messaging. If you are funding or volunteering for a group and you've only got $50,000 to spend on mail and you've got 100,000 targets or 200,000 targets, well, this particular type of messaging seems to be doing a lot better among men than women. These are the types of things that we really like to figure out with our messages because every organization always needs more resources and is always looking for ways to get better results while spending less money. And this was an instance where, I mean, if we had just decided to send all of the mail to men and none of it to women, we probably would have gotten the same result for half the cost. Now, the good news is we have other messages that work particularly well with people identified as female in the voter file, but this is how we mix and match and optimize our messaging. All right. Final specific experiment I want to get into is volunteer postcards. Many of you wrote volunteer postcards for the Environmental Voter Project, and we are extraordinarily grateful to you. Many of you have also been uh, politely asking us for about two and a half years to do volunteer postcards. And I want to thank you as well for being so patient with us. What you probably heard Shannon and me and others tell you is we're not going to do volunteer postcards until we are certain that they can actually increase turnout. And for the longest time, we saw a whole lot of organizations doing volunteer postcards and they weren't getting statistically significant results increasing turnout. And we didn't feel comfortable asking our volunteers to do that work, nor did we feel comfortable asking our donors to fund that work. But in 2021, we started to see that a specific type of postcard with very specific language on it was starting to get statistically significant increases in turnout. And so, we started a pilot program that many of you were involved in, in Tempe and Sarasota, and then we moved on to Colorado, and then for the midterm, we did it in New Mexico. Colorado was the really, really big one. And in Colorado, we wanted to make sure that we reached out to enough voters with these volunteer postcards that we would at least maximize our chance to get a statistically significant result. And you blew the doors off it, guys. Our volunteers had a huge, huge impact. And that's not only important for the growth of the political movement in Colorado, but it gives all of us the confidence that at least this specific type of volunteer postcard does work. It does work, unlike, to be honest, a lot of other volunteer postcards. And so what we did, it was just one card going to each voter. In this case, it was six inches by four and two and a half, it's maybe the size of your hand if you hold it sideways, to almost 80,000 Coloradans. Again, these were people 30 and over who were drop-off voters because we used a little bit of loss aversion messaging in this too. It increased turnout 1.3 percentage points over our control group. A big, big result. This was the design. Again, 
a little, a little bit happier than the other loss aversion one. It just leads with that thank you. But we really wanted to thank people. And let's face it, it's also a little creepy. People are like, huh? How do they know that I voted? It, it very subtly lets them know, hey, whether you vote or not is public record. But we wanted to thank people. Thank you for voting in 2020. And then you'll see at the top, we had that pre-printed -print, language. Who you vote for is secret whether you vote as public record, here's some basic information. And then in green, this was the, the language that volunteers hand wrote. And as you recognize, it's pure loss aversion messaging. Thanks for being a good voter in 2020. Keep your good voting record by voting in the upcoming primary election. And then sign with a name and volunteer. These got great results. As I say, I'm going to Go back there, 1.3 percentage point increase in turnout over our control group. That's really, really extraordinary. So those were three messaging experiments that we really, really wanted to drill down on. We did more messaging experience uh, experiments during the midterm general, so hopefully we'll have more to report back to you. But I want to leave off the experiments there and rush to the finish now so that we can have some time for the Q&A. Um, oh, yeah, this just goes over the results that I just told you, that, that 1.3 percentage point boost in turnout over our control group. If you want more information on our results, we have written up full reports on the last two of the experiments that I just showed to you. So the loss aversion mail in Pennsylvania and the postcards in Colorado. And so we'll provide links to those in the chat. They're full PDFs. You can share them with people who might be interested in this and read more of the details there. And those live on our website. All right. What's coming up? Well, believe it or not, uh, when the Environmental Voter Project says it's always election day for us somewhere, we ain't lying. There is an election coming up on Tuesday, December 20th. And it was only announced three days ago on Monday. That's how quickly our team jumps on these things. So the special election for the 4th Congressional District in Virginia is happening in about a month and a half, but first they have a primary. It's what's called a firehouse primary, uh, which I think comes from them just like having to do it really quickly and literally like open up firehouses for people to vote there. Uh, if you would like to jump on our phone banks, we will be having them Monday evening and uh, noon Eastern on election day. Uh, on Tuesday. We would love to have you join us. This is an example of an election where nobody's going to be doing anything except for the Environmental Voter Project, and you have an enormous opportunity to make a difference, an enormous opportunity. So we would love to have you join us. All right. Looking beyond that, these are some of the elections that we see coming up. In January, we will have volunteers reaching out to voters for January and early February elections. And you'll see there are some specials in Virginia and Pennsylvania that are coming up. And some of these are enormously important races in and of themselves. But all of them are enormously important for building good, consistent voting habits among these low propensity environmental voters. Then in February, we continue with those Pennsylvania specials, we have the general election for that fourth congressional I just told you about. And then we start this run of really, really important mayoral and municipal elections in February, March, April. We're talking about Tampa, Florida, Phoenix, Jacksonville, Anchorage, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Denver. It's something that people don't realize about some of those places in Colorado. Colorado Springs and Fort Collins have municipally owned utilities, at least one of which I think is a coal-fired power plant. These are municipally owned utilities that are run by city councilors, and they're up for election in a few months. These are very, very high leverage opportunities for the climate movement. And then you'll see in April, we'll start mobilizing people for the Pennsylvania primary again. There's going to be an Allegheny County uh, executive election. There's going to be an open Philadelphia mayoral primary. And then some of the biggest cities in Texas have elections. These are some big, big races that are coming up. And so, yeah, we ain't resting at all. 
Finally, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are going to get to the Q&A in a second. But all of you are involved in the Environmental Voter Project because, at least to some extent, you, you buy into some of like the nerdiness of what we do. I mean, let's be honest, we, <laughs> we don't have a lot of the sexiness of your typical like political organization. We don't endorse candidates. You can't like get into a ballroom and shake hands with someone famous and clink champagne on election night because we won. But what we do bring is a degree of precision and certainty about our impact that almost nobody else has. And so I know it's kind of a bummer that you have to wait a few weeks and often a few months to find out whether the stuff that you did three months ago actually had an impact. But boy, is that better than never knowing if you ever had an impact at all. And so I just want to say thank you for doing this crucially important work with us. And perhaps more importantly, thank you for having these impacts. We will continue to put reports up on our website. We will continue to have webinars like this when we get more results coming in so that we can tell you about the stuff that worked and the stuff that didn't work. We embrace our failures and hopefully learn from them as well. And so we promise to continue doing this and to continue reporting back to you. But for now, Let's have that Q and A session that uh, that Shannon mentioned. Yes, I'm still answering a couple questions that have come in. So if yours is still sitting there, don't worry. Um, we will get to it as we're going through. But a uh, big question that came out a few times, Nathaniel, what are we thinking about in terms of expansion in terms of 2023? Yes, yes. So we don't know yet. But let me just be really transparent about the process that we use. So we have gotten about 70 or 80% of the way through a 50-state research analysis pro project. And what we are looking at is using some sort of publicly available predictive models on voter files. We are looking in all 50 states and trying to ascertain not only how many super environmentalists are there in each of these states, but how many of them vote in midterms? How many of them vote in local elections? How many of them vote in presidentials? Because no matter how good we are at the Environmental Voter Project, you know, if we identify 400 non voting environmentalists in Idaho, it kind of doesn't matter if we can get all 400 of them to vote. Like, that's not going to change anything. No, I don't know if that's the right number for Idaho. I'm just using it as an example. And sorry if, if any of you are from Idaho. No, no offense, men. But it's very, very important to us to be able to, first of all, do our jobs in an honest and fulfilling way, but also be able to lead you as volunteers and donors in an honest and fulfilling way. And so we take very seriously this approach of figuring out are the 17 states that we're currently working in still high impact opportunities? And two, are there any other states that we feel we can responsibly expand into with our, our financial and volunteer resources available and have them also be high impact? All right, that's the first thing that we look at. The second thing we look at is, is there a lot of room on the local, state, and federal level to really move the dial on climate policy? So yes, we do pay attention to that. Because of course, there are some really politically important states where, okay, we might not have identified a ton of non-voting environmentalists, but it's kind of in the middle. M maybe if it's really politically important, that might, might change our thinking a little bit. The third criteria we use is we really want active election calendars. The reason we want active election calendars, by which I mean states that have elections every year, not just even years, 
is because no matter how many of these experiments we run, and no matter how good we are at optimizing on the good stuff and forgetting about the bad stuff, and, and no matter how smart we think we are, the truth is our stubbornness gets us like twice as far as our intelligence does. By which I mean like repetition is golden. It's golden. In a state like Georgia that has elections every year, and as everybody is painfully aware, they have runoffs like every other month, we can just do so much more when it comes to changing people's habits, because we can talk to them like once every six weeks. Whereas in a state like, say, Oregon, where we consistently find a lot of non-voting environmentalists, they only have elections every two years. And that just dramatically reduces the number of times we can make these behavioral intervention opportunities. All right, so those are the three criteria we use. As far as what we're seeing, I can't tell you whether we will expand or not. That's something we're still analyzing, and there are obviously a lot of people who are part of that decision-making process. Uh, but I can tell you that the states that seem to be popping at the moment are not just purple states. There are also some really interesting red states uh, where all three of those criteria are really met. Does that mean that we're going to expand into red states or purple states or blue states? I don't know. And I'm not trying to be like squirrely here. I just want to be totally honest with you. Like I, I'm not the only decision maker here. Uh, we have a lot of important uh, staff that we want to bring in. Well, all of our staff are important. We want them to be part of the decision. And we have a board. And they need to be part of the decision. But we will be making that decision over the next eight weeks based on those criteria that I just mentioned to you. And I wish I could give you an answer now. Believe me, I really wish I could. Uh, but those are the criteria we're using. And we'll know soon, I promise. Awesome. Um, really good question that came in. So Nathaniel, you mentioned our total number of you know voters that met our criteria. And then you mentioned that we had contacted about 2.4 million of those. What would you say our biggest barrier is to filling that gap between being able to contact every single voter on our list? Money. Money. Uh, yeah. I mean, th there are smaller barriers. Uh, certainly, we could become a much more inefficient, expensive operation and open up offices, like three offices in every state and, and hire lots of canvassers and things like that. But I, I don't think we will ever get to get to that point where we, we sort of rely on a very inefficient process like that. The biggest barrier is not being able to have broad reach throughout the year. And that's money. That's money that helps with mail. That's money that helps with digital ads. Uh, and in particular, it's in the early part of the year. Uh, I mean, if you're in the voter turnout business, what you can't do is ask people for their financial support and then not spend it on the really big November elections, right? You would not be very happy with me if in December we still had a whole bunch of money sitting in the bank account. Like that, that's not how I want to run a voter turnout organization. But what that also means is we roll into these elections that I just told you about, you know, February, March, April elections, where we have lots of voters that we can potentially contact and it's very high leverage opportunities. And we aren't sitting on a whole bunch of money. Now that's, that's by design, right? Like I, we want to spend the money on really important elections, but that also means that we don't have the ability to hit every one of the targets that we want. So I guess there are two answers to that question, money, and in particular, money at specific, at, at earlier points in the year, at earlier points in the year. And just to give you an idea, uh, we are heading into 2023. We'll probably have a $3 million budget, but this is kind of hard to calculate, but 
my best estimate is that we could spend as much as 8.2 or 8.3 million dollars before reaching a point of diminishing returns where our our each dollar we spend starts getting a slightly lower voter turnout returns so we could i mean we could almost triple the budget that we are going to put forward and still be just as efficient uh, so yeah Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. All right, we'll keep going through. Um, a great question. So if we mobilize a voter, you know, in 2022, we got that person to vote. How confident are we that they're going to keep voting, like in the 2023 or especially in the 2024? Uh, we never assume that anybody will keep voting. Uh, and so what we always do is going into each new election, we rebuild our target populations anew. This is what I mean by that. Let's say you are someone who voted in the 2022 midterm. Well, just because you vote in a high salience, high turnout national midterm election doesn't mean you're likely to vote in an odd year general election, let alone a municipal election, let alone a municipal primary. And so even though throughout, say, the course of 12 months, our definition of an environmentalist won't change, throughout the course of 12 months, our definition of who is likely to vote in particular elections will absolutely change. And so I often think of it as like a, a bubble that expands and contracts. Our target population of, of unlikely voters for these local elections this year is enormous. Whereas for a presidential election where you have really high turnout, well, a lot of those environmentalists who don't vote in local elections are going to vote. So that means we're not gonna bother giving them our behavioral interventions, right? They don't need a nudge. They already vote in presidential elections. So in presidential elections, our target population is a lot smaller. So to more precisely answer your question, we're coming off an election that's kind of halfway in between, right? The bubble's like here. Midterm is kind of like a mid-level turnout election. We're heading into an odd year. And so that means there are a lot of those people who even though they just voted in November, we don't expect them to vote this year. And our target population is actually going to be bigger this year in many states, because as I'm sure you can imagine, there are plenty of people who vote in midterms who don't vote in their local mayoral election or don't vote in their odd year constitutional amendment elections. And yeah, we aren't just going to assume that they're going to show up. And that's a great, great question. Awesome. So um, as you look into 2023, Nathaniel, what voter contact like methods do you think that we're going to be using? What are ways that volunteers uh, can get involved? Yeah, so uh, we are certainly going to continue phone banking. Uh, it is easy. Uh, our volunteers, even if they start out a little a little trepidatious, end up loving it. And as you can see, we now have the receipts. We know that it works. And so we're going to continue doing that. We are also going to continue canvassing, but as part of our uh, just strategic planning, we're trying to figure out a way that we can have more robust canvassing options. And it's something that we're still working on, but my guess is we're going to end up rather than just saying, hey, anybody who wants to canvas anywhere, we'll figure out a way to make it happen. Because as you can imagine, uh, on an organizational side of things, that, that's kind of inefficient. Uh, instead, I think what we're probably going to end up doing, although don't quote me on this, is finding a few, or maybe more than a few, really strategic places where there's a, a really dense population of canvassable targets for us. And we've got lots of volunteers and focus, try to focus our canvassing operations on those places. Uh, we will almost definitely have postcarding available as well. And we are going to spend a lot of the next two months to 
kick the tires on whether we can bring texting back. Uh, but for those of you who have heard me talk about texting before, uh, we uh, we are not going to put our donors' funds to us at risk by doing something that is not permitted. Uh, and contacting people who have not opted in to receiving texts, we have been told by mobile carriers, will mean that fines are, are, are levied on us. And our donors don't donate to us for us to pay fines. Uh, that being said, there are a lot of organizations that are still texting and because they say, and maybe they're right, eh, I don't think the fines are going to come. And I, you know, sometimes I wish I had the, <laughs> I, I I wasn't anxious like, <laughs> and, and, and I was willing to do that. But I I don't I don't want to ask for money from our donors, knowing that there's a chance that they will go to paying off fines. And perhaps even more importantly, we don't want to ask our volunteers to send texts when we are hearing back from mobile carriers that sometimes as many as half of them are being blocked and not going through. That's a not that's not a good use of your time, but. I brought this up for a reason. We are very mindful of the fact that texting was something that volunteers enjoyed doing. And so we really want to do an exhaustive search of all of the vendors to see, is there a way that other vendors and other organizations are doing this such that we can have a higher level of confidence that our volunteers' time is actually well spent and the texts are going through. So we are going to be looking into that. I don't know if it's going to happen. But I am sure that you will have the canvassing, the postcarding, and the phone calling opportunities, without a doubt. And in fact, there are phone calling opportunities for you on Monday and Tuesday. Don't close the book on 2022 yet. I promise you. And it's not just because of this particular election. Virginia, the state legislature in Virginia, has elections in November. This is a very, very important state. And if you remember back to a year ago, it kind of surprised a whole lot of people. And if you want new environmental voters to show up this fall in Virginia, well, they're going to be born now. They're going to be born next Tuesday if we get them out to vote. And they're going to be born in January and February in these specials that we're mobilizing people for. So please join us on those phone banks as well. All right, do we have time for one more, Shannon, or is that it? I think that's it. But there were a couple people that did ask, like, how can they help with this Virginia election that is this Tuesday with one week's notice from when they declared the election? You can see that link in the chat now, folks. It's that Get Involved link. Um, if you're one of our trained callers, you're also going to get an email about it. So don't worry, but I invite you to do that right now. If you can't copy and paste the links, check out your email tomorrow. You're going to get a follow-up from this webinar. It will have all these links that were in the chat, uh, as well as a recording here. If we didn't get to your question, you can reply to that email, or better yet, join one of our other upcoming events, and we'll be happy to answer that for you. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everybody who spent this time with us. And most importantly, Thank you for creating these results. This is a collaborative process. We do it with you. You have now seen the receipts yourself. Your volunteer efforts made this stuff happen. We literally could not have done much of this without you. I hope you take pride in that. And I hope you see our work with the Environmental Voter Project as something that not just we are doing, but that you are doing with us. And so thank you. And we promise to keep you updated on our thoughts on expansion and also the, the, the other data that we get back once we have updated voter files from this November. So thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the year. And I know we hope to see you on the phone banks on Monday and Tuesday. Bye, everybody.